The Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital presents its fifth annual conference, No Longer a Child, Not Yet an Adult, Ethical Issues in Adolescent Healthcare. The Truman Katz Center is the nation's first center dedicated solely to the study of ethics relating to research and healthcare for children. This is a problem in the United States, actually, uh, as most of you likely know, among industrialized nations, uh, we have the highest rate of adolescent uh, birth rate. And the vast majority of these pregnancies are unintended. Among those, the incidence of preterm birth is more than double when compared with adult mothers, uh, mothers over 20, we'll say, and uh, the neonatal death rate is nearly triple. Um, and so I'm here as a bioethicist and as a neonatologist. So while so many of the speakers have really been quite expert in the subject of adolescent rights and adolescent care, um, by means of full disclosure, my main job in the hospital is as a neonatologist, and that is the patient, the baby that I tend to focus on. I want to focus on this patient and on this particular case. A 15-year-old girl delivers an infant at 23 weeks gestation. The infant is critically ill in the newborn intensive care unit. Now, as many of you know, and just to remind you that roughly speaking, at 23 weeks, uh, the child has about a one in three chance of survival if we provide aggressive intensive care. Maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, depending on details. In addition, that child, if we do this, and if the child is going to be one of the survivors, we're looking at three, maybe four months in the newborn intensive care unit. A very difficult course for the child and for the family and for the staff, but most of all for the child. Um, Moreover, among those survivors, a significant number are going to have significant uh, permanent neurologic sequelae. <clears throat> In this particular case, the mother lives with the maternal grandmother with whom she says she has a good relationship, and the baby's father is no longer involved. The day after delivery, the neonatologist goes up to the mother's room uh, to talk about the many difficult uh, things we're likely to face and some difficult decisions we have to make regarding the infant's care. The mother's alone in the room, she's watching uh, television, and she seems quite annoyed when the physician suggests that we should turn the television off and speak for a few minutes. The child's mother speaks minimally and avoids eye contact. It's in that setting that I want to ask this fundamental question. But first, the thought about informed consent, again, as, as you're all well aware, the doctrine of informed consent says that our patients in the hospital, they should be informed of their situation, they should be informed of the reasonable options and the likely outcome of each of those options, having your gallbladder out, not having your gallbladder out, being in the intensive care unit, uh, on the ventilator, not being in the intensive care unit, and so on, and then permitted to make a choice. And as you know well, patients who are unable to speak for themselves have a surrogate decision maker. So the doctrine of informed consent requires us to do the same with the surrogate decision maker. Um, and the question that I'd like to ask you this morning is, who should be the surrogate decision maker for a critically ill infant born to a 15-year-old mother? Put another way, should the 15-year-old mother be accorded the same authority uh, that we would accord to an adult mother? Now, uh, there's two questions, two ways to approach this question, of course, the legal uh, and the ethical approach. Let me just say, start with the standard practice and the law in Connecticut. Uh, because, as I think most of you are aware, Connecticut being the largest and most influential of the states, we have, there was a lot of state pride going on yesterday, so I'm, I'm in, I'll play. So we have uh, uh, essentially the epicenter of neonatal care, I think, in the Western Hemisphere is, is uh, Connecticut. And so what, is, what are the rules in Connecticut? What do we do in Connecticut? Well, here is um, my, and I know this, but here are the words of, of our hospital attorney. Legally, an unemancipated minor, that is one still living with her parents, could consent to open heart surgery for her child, but would need her parents' consent for her own ingrown toenail procedure. Um, I've discussed this with a friend of mine, a new friend of mine who I've taught with who's a federal judge, and explained the situation to him, and he's well aware of the law, and as we talked about it, he said, well, this is not what the law was intended to do, to give these young adolescent mothers uh, this sort of authority over these, inf these critically ill infants. And when, it, when we talked about the law, his response was quite simply, it was a memorable moment. He said, the law doesn't fit. Um, I would leave you, before we move on from the legal question, with probably the best legal advice you're ever going to get, um, passed on by one of Connecticut's most famous sons, um, Abraham Lincoln. 
who at the second inaugural address said, don't take legal advice from a neonatologist. <laughs> so that is my legal advice for you today. I'm not really here to discuss the legal question at any length because two reasons. One is, of course, we come from different states and indeed different nations, and so the laws are going to be different from place to place. More importantly, I'm not qualified to have that conversation with you. I do want to address some ethical issues and suggest to you that what we may be dealing with, to some extent, is a conflict of rights. Specifically, we have the parent's right to decide for her child. She has a right to make these decisions for her child. This is something that I think as a culture we've accepted. Um, alongside that, I would say that the child, the patient, it's interesting using the term child and sometimes you do a double take. When I refer to the patient here, again, I'm giving you the perspective of the neonatologist. The mother's gonna be discharged from the hospital the next day. The patient is in fact the baby in the ICU. I would say the patient has a right to an adequate surrogate decision maker. And the patient also has a right to justice. And what do I mean by justice? By justice, I guess I mean equal treatment, that people should be treated equally unless there's a relevant, more of a relevant moral difference between them to justify differential treatment. Um, so what about equal treatment? Well, my question is this. Would this 15-year-old mother be permitted to serve as a surrogate decision maker for her own mother if it was necessary? If her own mother were in a position where she couldn't speak for herself, where life and death decisions needed to be made about her medical care, would we as a medical community then turn to her, own living, her only living relative, this 15-year-old girl, and say, we need your consent, we want to take your mother for heart surgery, and we need your consent? I would suggest to you, and my friends in the legal profession agree, that there is absolutely no way that that's how it would work. I think the thoughtful, caring physicians and others would certainly turn to the 15-year-old daughter, her only living relative, and say, we need your help working this out. You deserve to have a lot of input into this, but we would not look to this 15-year-old to decide for her mother, because everyone is entitled to an adult surrogate decision maker. Well, I guess almost everyone, because in fact, infants and small children currently in Connecticut are not. Just in general, and these were questions that were, were discussed yesterday in, uh, at greater length and I think uh, with greater uh, skill than I'll be able to do this morning, but the question is, are adolescents at all competent to serve as medical decision makers? In general, and you all know this, those of you who serve on ethics committees and those of you who have to answer this question, there are three capacities, it's a bit of a simplification, but there are three capacities we look for to determine if someone could be a competent medical decision maker. The first is understanding and communication and it includes conceptual and cognitive abilities. And of course, communication is actually an important issue. In this scenario, it's no secret that this mother just gave uh, minimal answers, and indeed, this is not an uncommon scenario, as those of you who work with adolescents know, where we are trying to make life and death decisions about a child, uh, and the mother gives us one-syllable answers and won't look, look at us and really wants desperately to get those cartoons back on the television. The second is reasoning and deliberation, that, that skill that develops over the course of adolescence and perhaps beyond. And the third is uh, a set of values or morals for which to, to which to apply those, uh, those, that, that reasoning and deliberation. How do these different options and their outcomes compare with or relate to my view, my goals in life, my morals? This is how an individual decides for oneself. So is this 15-year-old competent to make medical decisions even for herself. Well, on the first two, the understanding, the cognitive abilities, and the reasoning and deliberation, it has been said uh, by uh, Dan Brock and others that in going over all this stuff, and Dan Brock's not a psychologist, but in, in, uh, his, in much of his writing, and we have heard that in general, <clears throat> excuse me, by 14 or 15, these skills are in general in place. Um, now, there are some recent data suggesting that there is morphological development of the brain well beyond 14 or 15. And yesterday we heard uh, some terrific information and a great talk telling us that this goes beyond 14 or 15. What I would say, though, in defense of the adolescent's ability to make decisions, is the fact that brain development continues beyond 14 or 15 um, does not itself prove that by 14 or 15, one has not reached a level of development sufficient to make medical decisions. Um, indeed, you know, when I teach, I think that, that we've learned that essentially you get to somewhere in your 20s and finally everything has come together and it's, it's all the wiring is in place and it's really clicking and then you've got about an hour and a half and then, <laughs> and, and so the, 
and there's probably a few people in the room here who are actually at that hour and a half, which is very exciting. The bad news is you're spending your hour and a half listening to someone whose hour and a half was a long time ago. <laughs> what about their values and their conception of the good life? Um, this is an excellent quote from an article, uh, from a chapter rather by Blue City Moreno, that says the developing moral selfhood of the normal teenager renders the authenticity of his or her judgments more suspect uh, than that of the normal adult. A teenager's oppositional stance, while perhaps not defective in a purely cognitive sense, is probably not based on a well-established set of values that constitute a stable and recognizable moral self. So that third requirement, that we take that reasoning and apply it to our moral self, maybe one that's not fully established uh, in adolescence, and indeed that's what's suggested by these authors. Moreover, there's just the question of experience, and here's a, from an article by Galen, and quoted and supported by our own Laney Ross, that surely part of what goes into our abridgment of the child's autonomy is the recognition that although he may be competent, the limitation of his experiences distorts his capacity for sound judgment. Experiences also count for something. And, and this, by the way, really is the Connecticut River close to where I live. Um, that part's not a joke. If you've been up the river a few times, you're less likely to hit a rock. Um, and there is something to be said for experience, and perhaps a better metaphor would be a highway and a car driving on the highway. Um, I don't think any of us argue that 16-year-olds don't have the reflexes or the eyesight um, to drive a car skillfully, but the data about their ability to avoid trees and other automobiles uh, is pretty clear as well. So all that said, what do we do now? The current standard in Connecticut, and I think be well beyond Connecticut as well, I think this is a problem, is that most 15-year-olds are generally not accorded the same autonomy as adults with regard to making medical decisions for themselves. And this is, a, this is certainly throughout the United States. In general, we don't let 15-year-olds make their own medical decisions this, to the same degree that we let 18 or 30 or 40-year-olds. And they're certainly not permitted to make medical decisions for adult relatives. Well, I would suggest that if we think they have the requisite skills, that that's an injustice. But if, on the other hand, we don't, then perhaps it's an injustice to allow them to serve as surrogate decision makers for their infants. Again, it would appear that the adults are all entitled to an adult surrogate decision maker, but these critically ill infants are not. Um, now, the AAP tells us, well, there are exceptions, so we can't treat minors without parental consent, but there are exceptions. And the AAP breaks down the, the exceptions into these four categories, which again, many of you are familiar with. Emergencies, uh, things related to sexual health and pregnancy, um, the mature minor, and the emancipated minor. Um, and it is these last two that I want to focus on for a minute. When, trying, when the AAP tries to describe to us what a mature minor should be th thought of as, what should be, generally, she's 14 or older, She's sufficiently mature and possesses the intelligence to understand and appreciate the benefits, risks, and alternatives of the proposed treatment, and able to make a voluntary and rational choice. In determining whether the mature minor exception applies, that is to say whether we can let them make decisions without their parents' consent, the MD must consider the nature and degree of risk, and whether the proposed treatment is for the minor's benefit, is necessary or elective, and is complex. So I would suggest to you that this guides me to think that our application of the mature minor doctrine should be, we should be very careful. We should set the threshold high, specifically because these decisions are not just about, and not even primarily about, what's good for the minor who's making the decision. They're primarily about someone else. I would suggest to you that the degree of risk is colossal and that the complexity is about as high as it gets. So it's very different than allowing the mature minor, again, uh, degrees of issues of sexual health are aside, but allowing the mature minor to say, make decisions that are, that are uh, relatively straightforward. These decisions are not relatively straightforward, and we see adult, parent, uh, adult parents agonize over these decisions um, at great length. The other exception is the emancipated minor. And here, it's a minor who's self-reliant and, and someone who is, for example, married or in the military, living away from the parents. It's recognized and different states will recognize this differently. That these are emancipated minors. Therefore, they have a right. You don't need their parents' consent. If you've got a 17-year-old who's in the military or you have a 17-year-old who lives apart and has her own family and she's married, whatever criteria you set forth, you don't need her parents' consent to give her medical care. 
In some states, pregnant minors or minor mothers are also included. And to me, this always struck me as a, as a strange twist, and I don't mean to be um, sarcastic, but it always struck me as strange that if we say that this 15-year-old girl cannot make, if I look at a set of 15-year-old twins, and if I say that, well, they cannot make their own medical decisions without their mother's permission, these twin girls. Uh, but if one shows the good judgment to get pregnant at 14 and have a baby at 15, she is now able to make decisions for herself. And again, we're talking about decisions for herself. Now, the levels of this and the reason for this are, are complex, and I certainly understand that. But again, we're talking not here really about making decisions for yourself. We're talking about taking it to a different level, which is making decisions for someone else. If, nevertheless, we were to accept that the adolescent mother should be permitted to decide for herself, for perhaps she meets one of those exceptions, or perhaps we feel she has the requisite skills, does it follow then that she should necessarily be permitted to serve as the surrogate decision maker for her critically ill baby? What, taking a step back, what is really the ethical justification for letting parents decide? Why do parents get to decide instead of grandparents or instead of uh, uh, the governor of the state of Washington? Why is it that parents get to decide for children? Ethicists generally group these justifications, again, to four rough answers. And again, I don't mean to oversimplify, but I think this, this illustrates the point. One is that parents know the child best. I don't know if that's necessarily relevant to a newborn. Um, the second is that parents, because of their affection and close ties, are most likely to do what is best for the child. The third is that parents, more than anyone else except the child, will have to live with the consequences of the decisions. And the fourth is that parents have a basic right to raise their children as they feel appropriate. Well, let me go back and look at the first one. So number one, I don't know quite what to make. I, I think one could argue that, that the mother had an intimate, one could certainly argue that the mother of this child had an intimate relationship with this child long before birth and up to the point of birth. Um, beyond that, I don't know that the mother necessarily knows the child from that point forward um, better than others. And I would particularly, for the point of argument, out of interest, say, let's compare the mother to the maternal grandmother. The mother, because of her affection and close ties, is more likely to do what is best for the child. Is she really more likely than the grandmother to do what is best for the child? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Um, again, bearing in mind, this is the judgment of an adolescent compared to the judgment of an adult, which may be better, may be worse, but is uh, very often different. Third is that parents, more than anyone else except the child, will have to live with the consequences of the decisions. This struck me as interesting when I first saw that argument because, as many of you know, it is quite common, in fact, for the maternal grandmother to be the one who raises this child, um, this child perhaps with significant disabilities. Um, and the last point, that parents have a basic right to raise their children as they feel appropriate. I certainly agree with that as a parent. I would suspect that the vast majority of us feel the same way. It's worth, however, recognizing that this is just a little bit of a cultural norm that we've come to expect that is handed down to us from, uh, from centuries and centuries and centuries past. This has its history in, in the Roman culture and beyond where fathers had the, the right of life over death over their children. We think, we get it, parents are in charge of their kids. And I will just tell you a brief anecdote that I had a child some years ago in our newborn intensive care unit who was... Um, a group that's, uh, I think, officially known as Roma, but they themselves call themselves gypsies, and I think they're most common, more commonly known to you as gypsies. In their culture, at least this group, it was accepted that the grandfather is in charge of the children. He makes the decisions, not the parents. Now, the parents provide the minute-to-minute day-to-day care, but the grandfather is the boss. I suspect that's not unique to their clan or their culture either. I will tell you that the whole staff of the newborn intensive care unit was just, you know, they could see the steam coming out of their ears because it doesn't compute. Because our culture says parents are in charge. Their culture says grandparents are in charge. Is there something inherently, innately better by putting, you know, parents versus grandparents? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's just our culture that says it should be parents. Um, and I, as a parent, endorse that. Um, but also I'm willing to recognize that maybe sometimes we need to step back and say that there need to be exceptions to that. So parents have a basic right to raise their children as they feel appropriate. 
So for a moment, let's again consider the rights-based analysis of this original question. I want to go back to the question. Should the 15-year-old should the, uh, mother have the same right to serve as surrogate decision maker, the same responsibilities as would an adult mother? So on the one hand, we have the rights of the adolescent parents, the right to raise their children as they feel appropriate. On the other, we have the right of the newborn to an adequate surrogate decision maker, and I would suggest to you that most of us have a right, all of us in this room have a right to an adult surrogate decision maker, but yet this child does not have that right. Um, but there's another right which we've lost track of, which is the maternal grandmother's right. And she looks like she's enforcing one of those rights right now in that picture, doesn't she? <laughs> what happened to her right to raise her child as she feels appropriate? Did her right to raise her children as she deems appropriate disappear when her 14-year-old daughter became pregnant? Um, it's food for thought. I would suggest if we look at this on a rights-based analysis that we consider more than just the baby, more than just the mother and the baby, but in fact, there are others. And again, from my point of view, the patient before me is the one whose rights and interests I am frankly most concerned with. Now, we can, don't have to look at this on a rights-based analysis. There's, there are other ways to examine these problems, right? And perhaps better ways. And my own uh, mentor, uh, Roz Ladd, <clears throat> or Carol Gilligan and others have said, you know, you're, these principles, Ross calls it cookie cutter ethics when we look at principles and just say, well, we compare autonomy to beneficence and that, that a, a, a different approach to these things brought forth by these folks and others is that we have to consider the web of relationships and the importance of relationships and how those relationships will be affected by our decisions and what do our, how do our decisions affect the relationships in which we live. That as someone rightly pointed out yesterday, we don't live in, uh, as an isolated autonomous individual on an island by ourselves. We live in the midst of a community, very commonly in the midst of a family. And family-centered care is something that many of us hold valuable. I would suggest to you that such an approach that looks at the relationships, that looks at family-centered care, may be consistent with a larger and more formal role for some other adult in the family. For example, the maternal grandmother or the maternal grandfather, but not necessarily them. I think that we can look beyond the 15-year-old mother to others. And we do look to them, surely, for advice. But nevertheless, the fact is, where I live and perhaps where many of you live, if I want to sign up a newborn baby for my clinical trial, all I need is his 14-year-old mother to sign on the dotted line. And that's what stands between that child and my clinical trial. Now, of course, it's been reviewed by the IRB and others, and of course, I'm an honorable, trustworthy guy. But the fact is, if I want to sign you up for my clinical trial, I've got to go through an adult who may be, may be a little bit more difficult to convince, may be a little bit uh, easier to coerce. It depends. These approaches, whether we look at it from a rights-based analysis and consider the rights of that newborn, or whether we look at it from the point of view, um, from the point of view of the web of relationships, I think either way, uh, a different approach is suggested. And I think a shared responsibility between this child's mother and another adult member of the family, I believe that's probably uh, a, a more appropriate approach than what we currently uh, use. Um, now some would argue, why does it have to be a family member? Even if, we, even if you concede to the concerns I have about these various, uh, this child's rights and the various concerns about this adolescent mother, and they're very often troubled adolescents, you know, as serving as my surrogate decision maker, why does it have to be a member of the family? And I think that that's an excellent question and one worthy of, worthy of debate. In a, in a not too recent article from Dan Brock um, about the moral authority of family members to act as surrogates for incompetent patients. He goes through six grounds, and I won't drag you through all six because some of them are actually very similar to the ones we saw as the standard arguments for parents. They know them best. They have their best interests at heart. They're the ones who will suffer the consequences of the decision, uh, maybe not as much as the patient, but more than other people. These are all part of their moral authority. But he also talks about the family as an independent moral unit with decision-making responsibilities. And there is no denying, and most of us are not unhappy about it, 
There's no denying that the family is the fundamental unit in which we live. It is the family that's, in general, charged with responsibility for raising the child. It's the family, that's, it's how we, those are our longest, for most of us, our longest and deepest relationships. And it is the family that that's, gets most involved when we are elderly and sick and dying. The family is, is how we are defined as individuals. Um, and so I think that the family is where we start, recognizing that some families are better than others, and that's to be expected, but some families will fall below some threshold where we say at this point, it's really not the best thing for this child to be looked after even by an adult member of that family. We really don't think, though, while we agree that this 15-year-old mother needs the guidance of an adult, we really don't think that her mother is necessarily the right adult and we need to look elsewhere. I understand that, but I would say that the place to start would be the family. There was a chapter in a book called The Adolescent Alone about troubled adolescents, adolescents that are basically alienated from their family. And it's a wonderful chapter regarding health care for adolescents. And it was intended basically to remind us of what our responsibilities to these adolescent patients are. And they outlined, um, Bluestein, Dubler, and Levine, the editors of these books who wrote this chapter, outlined um, four of those, those responsibilities in four major categories, which are worth, I think, us considering, because we have a tremendous obligation to our patients, including our adolescent patients. Healthcare providers have a moral obligation to respect each adolescent as a unique person and to support his or her developing autonomy. Um, that, that is not to say to uh, pretend that it is done developing. Indeed, none of us are done developing. Let's be honest about this. And someone smarter than me made this observation long ago. And I think it might have been Roz Ladd, my, my teacher. It might have been someone else. But, but the 30-year-old looks at the 15-year-old and says, you know, you really don't have any perspective. You haven't been far enough up the river to really understand where the rocks are and how to avoid them. And of course, then the 60-year-old looks at the 30-year-old and says, you know, you really don't have enough perspective. You haven't been far enough up the river. And uh, there's no question that, except for the fact that the wires are getting loose, um, our measure of experience uh, changes. And so we're all still developing. We're all still works in progress. But the curve is very steep for the adolescent, and we need to recognize that and do the best we can to help them get up the curve. The second thing they tell us is that we have a, ob a moral obligation to treat adolescents fairly and avoid discrimination. This is a warning for me personally as I stand here before you and raise this problem, because Am I suggesting we discriminate against these kids because they, simply because they're adolescents? Uh, should I, do I say that we should treat that 15-year-old different than a 25-year-old? Uh, and the short answer is yes, but. The short answer is that, that, that I su I'm suggesting that our default position for a 25-year-old should be that the 25-year-old um, can speak for her child. We may find ourselves in a circumstance where she really can't, but we should start from there believing that she can and then pursue it. Um, for a 15-year-old to be making life and death decisions for someone else, um, I will need to be convinced that that's the right thing to do in each individual case. The third is because of the need for beneficent guidance, healthcare providers should work with adolescents to identify a supportive and responsible adult who will assist them in decision making. And of course, this is what we do, I should suggest to you, that we want it when we're dealing with an adolescent making decisions for themselves, which is tough enough, we try and find an adult. Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your aunt, whoever it is, who's going to work with you. And maybe it's, maybe it's not a relative, I recognize that. Someone's going to work with you and help you sort these things through. It really shouldn't be the attending physician. We should not serve in the surrogate uh, role because there's a certain measure of checks and balances in all of this as well. That someone who speaks to the child shouldn't just be the physician. Um, except in extreme emergencies. Um, so they need to identify that, that adult, certainly for themselves, in our practice with critically ill newborns, is we too, we try and bring in, we say, well, who do you trust? Bring somebody to the meeting who you trust. We're going to sit and talk about your baby. Bring someone who you trust. Um, and they often do, not always, but often do. And I, what I am suggesting simply is that, that this should not be an option, but rather should be required. The fourth is that healthcare providers have a moral obligation to promote the well-being of their patients and to minimize harm. Now this was in a chapter and written by authors who were intending to remind us of our obligation to our adolescent patients. And I wholly endorse all four 
principles. I would also suggest to you that we have, that with rights come obligations, in other words, with the patient's right to beneficent guidance comes our obligation to see that they have it. I would also suggest to you that the adolescent patient has a right uh, and we have an obligation to promote the well-being and to minimize harm. And lastly, I would suggest to you that the newborn patient deserves no less. And that, in fact, is my patient. The little one is my patient. And that I have, all of us involved in her care, have an obligation to make sure her interests are addressed adequately and to minimize harm. I would also suggest to you that the right, the need for and the right to beneficent guidance doesn't disappear the day a teenage girl becomes pregnant. If you look at it, not only does she use some guidance, it looks like the fellow off to the right could probably stand with a little beneficent guidance of his own. Our obligations have not ended to them and certainly exist for the child as well. Everybody in the picture needs beneficent guidance. Finally, I would suggest to you that um, no longer a child, not yet an adult. This is not science, this is not ethics in the book, this is just my own personal opinion that I'll throw here, is that I think that perhaps there are really two steps to being an adult, to becoming an adult. And if someone asked me, if I was sitting around the dinner table, and my kids were to ask me, what does it mean to be an adult? To be an adult member of a community, because I share the opinions of Roz Ladd and Carol Gilligan and so many others who think we live in a web of relationships and that's terribly important. So to be an adult member of the family, to be an adult member of a community, I think what it means is being able and willing to look after the children. That's not the only thing it means, but I think perhaps there are two steps as we become adults. We gradually develop the skills and the willingness to make decisions and to take responsibility for ourselves. And then we gradually, we also gradually develop the skills and the willingness to take responsibility and make decisions for others, our dying parents, our sick children. I'm not convinced that these two things, both the right and the talent, the ability, are simultaneous. I'm certainly not convinced that the current, that the current approach is correct because the current approach suggests that in fact, even though we don't recognize this 15-year-old's ability or right to make decisions for herself, we are now going to give her the ability and the right to make decisions for someone else. I think that's backwards. I think the current approach uh, is not right. I think, as my friend said, it doesn't fit. Courts craft decisions based on specific fact patterns. So you need to be somewhat careful when you draw from those individual decisions into thinking about a complete doctrine. At no point are the courts really well able to craft an entire doctrine that covers everything or thinks about everything. Now this is also true to a certain extent about statues and we'll talk about those when they come into play. But all of this is just to keep in mind, there is an ethical doctrine here, but the law doesn't always set itself up to adequately reflect that ethical doctrine. So we sort of went back afterwards and said, well, there's this legal doctrine of informed consent. Let's think ethically about why we have this and why it's important. And I think that becomes particularly important when you talk about unusual cases like adolescents making decisions. Okay, so a big part of informed consent, uh, sometimes called a uh, requirement for informed consent, sometimes called an exception to informed consent, um, is that the individual must have the capacity to consent. It doesn't make sense to talk about informed consent unless you have a certain degree of capacity. And the way the law sets it up right now is with presumptions. And we've talked about these, a number of uh, speakers have already pointed out, that there's a presumption that before age 18, you are unable to consent, and after age 18, you are able to consent. And what I want to stress here is these are only presumptions. Now, people have already pointed out that, of course, some people under 18 are perfectly well able to consent, some people over 18, but what I want to suggest to you is the law also recognizes that. And I think it's very easy to forget that with adults, you have all these same obligations to evaluate capacity. You should not be accepting decisions from incapable adults. Now, we very often don't question adults at all, even in cases where we should. And we almost never question them when they agree to treatment, right? 
Now, that in fact is possibly a significant problem, right? If you really think what you're trying to do is respect autonomy through allowing informed decision making and you have a non-autonomous decision maker, you're not respecting autonomy at all. So these kinds of things still function. Kids or adults, all the law tells you is that we're gonna presume for one group one thing and we're gonna presume for another group another thing. And then you can have other evidence that pushes you different directions based on the presumption. The other thing to think about is that the presumptions are based on some assumptions. And they're assumptions about maturity, some of which we've talked about, responsibility, as in who's going to have responsibility for the outcome in this case. Will there be parents responsible for this child is one of the reasons why you might think parents have some role in decision making. But there will be cases where the parents, for example, may not have the responsibility. And at least um, uh, the speaker right before me mentioned, sometimes it's a parental figure, sometimes it's a grandparent. When you have a situation where the responsibility for the care of that child is going to not be the parent, you're going to have to think differently about who then has some rights of decision making, who's going to have some say. Uh, developmental stages, people have already pointed out before me, the law is having, making some assumptions based on developmental stages that in fact at this point somewhere in late adolescence, developmental stages get you to a point of decision making capacity. Um, and they're also making assumptions about the extent of medical experience and knowledge. There are some kids that have an enormous amount of experience with the medical system, with making decisions, and there are going to be some adults who, adults who have no experience. Um, and again, those things are going to vary. From a legal standpoint, um, and I'm gonna, I, I should point out, you know, I, I talk interchangeably with the words capacity and competence. Technically speaking, capacity is a determination made by medical or mental health professionals. Competence is a legal standard. It should be linked to capacity. That is to say, um, if you don't have certain capacities, we will not decide that you are in fact competent to make a legal decision. Um, but the legal decision about competence is usually made by a court. Um, not by uh, health professionals. Statutes vary on whether or not they even give you any indication about what we should use as a standard of competence. So there are general standards of competence and that's sort of the idea that if you fit a category like below the age of 18, you aren't competent or if you are a category above, you are. And as I suggested before, in most cases, those are presumptions based on those uh, particular uh, uh, groupings. Really what we're interested in here is specific capacity. Do you have the capacity to make this particular decision before us? And it may well be that adolescents have many, many capacities, but may or may not be able to make the decision before us. It could be that they can make some kinds of medical decisions, but not others. It could be that they can make many other kinds of decisions, but not medical decisions. So again, your real question is, what can they do in this context where we're asking them? And there's four standards that are often, um, or four components of a capacity standard that are often used, choice, understanding, appreciation, and reasoning. There is very little legal guidance about how to use these standards, even in states that actually have the standards articulated. And that's to say, some states don't say anything, but capacity means you can make an intelligent decision. And then it's up to you to try to figure out, well, what's an intelligent decision? What are the kinds of capacities you need to make an intelligent decision? Um, others actually use these kinds of terms. So they'll say, to make a medical decision to be capable or con to be considered competent, you have to evidence understanding. Um, you have to be able to make a choice. You have to be able to appreciate the consequences. Um, and you be able to have to be able to reason. But they don't tell you things like, should these standards vary based on things like the type of decision, the complexity of the decision, the risks of um, saying yes to that particular treatment or the risks of saying no to that treatment. So they don't give you a lot of other indication about how these can be flexible. And that's true both in the adult context and in the context of youth. So in both cases, there might be some legal framework that you can use, but it may not give you a ton of information about how to deal with everything. The other area where there's a little bit of legal guidance, but again, maybe not a great deal of guidance about what to do is in deciding for others. Now there's four categories that we talk about as individuals who can decide for others. Parents, uh, guardians who are legally appointed, surrogates who are informal decision makers based on the relationship with the individual, and proxies who are appointed by the individual. 
And there are some differences in the state statutes that uh, give this type of authority in the types of things some of these categories can consent to. There's no discussion at all in the literature, for example, about whether or not we should think, especially for older adolescents, about allowing either a surrogate type decision making model, where maybe it's not the parents we determine as the best decision makers, or whether we should allow them to appoint proxies. And maybe not with full legal authority, but how much should you listen to an adolescent telling you, for example, this should be my decision maker? especially adolescents who have progressive diseases where they know at some point that just serious decisions might need to be made. So what do you do about the fact that you've got you know, an adolescent with a serious disease, say around 16 or 17, who says to you, as I become less capacitated, you should be talking to my mom, not my dad. The other thing that the statutes uh, often don't give us indications on is how do you deal with the standards of decision making? So I put three standards up here. These are very sort of rough categories. Um, ideally, in our fantasy world that never works, what you, all you need to do is come in and effectuate the decision that the person made before. It's this wonderful model of autonomy that works even when the person's incapable, um, and it, it doesn't work in the real world. Um, it's unlikely even to be something we talk about in the context of children, um, because usually we're not dealing with ind individuals who are previously capable and told us what to do. But what about these other ones? So we have two notions of one of substituted judgment. You make a decision based on what the individual would have wanted had they were competent, and the other best interests. And we often throw around best interest as, as if it automatically should be the standard that we use in all of these contexts. But I'm not sure if it's clear whether or not as you get an older adolescent, you should be starting to think about the same things you think about in substituted judgment. Who is this person? What kind of decisions would they make? And we certainly do see parents sometimes take into consideration a few of these things. So you'll hear them say in the research decision-making context, say things like, my child always wanted to participate and help in these things, and I think it's important for them. So yes, I would consent to them doing this. So what do you do in those cases? And even more complicated, none of these standards have any mechanism in them right now to accommodate the individual who lacks capacity to make the decision, but doesn't lack all capacity. So these standards sort of assume you don't have a decision maker next to you that can do some of the decision making. And even in the adult context, we really struggle with this. What do you do when you have an individual who actually can participate to some extent, but maybe doesn't have the full capacity to make the, the, the decision? And there's a little bit in the guardianship literature now where they're sort of struggling, where individuals are saying, look, I, I'm appointed as a guardian in this case, but my individual um, who I'm supposed to make decisions for actually has some decision-making capacity. We don't want to give them full legal authority, but we want to accommodate some of their input. And the guardianship, the National Guardianship Association actually altered their code of ethics for guardians, starting to say, you have to be responsive to this. And these are all models and things I think we can start to think about um, in the context of adolescence. So what about deciding for children? So in addition to the legal issues that I pointed out here, I think there are also some conceptual and empirical issues that have not yet been talked about here at the conference, but will be important to think about, especially from a legal standpoint. So first of all, from a conceptual standpoint, if we think that informed consent does still have these dual goals of uh, protecting well-being and protecting autonomy, how does that function in the adolescent decision maker? So if you wanted to say, well, allowing the individual to make the decision has to um, enables you to promote their well-being because they know better than others what is in their well-being, what is in their interest. Well, how do you do that in the context of the adolescent who may not fully know what is in their interest? And this is, again, not to say this is not a debate about capacity. This is to say, well, if we think some of these ideas apply to adolescents, how do they actually apply when you think about adolescents? So adolescents need certain things, um, and children you know, throughout their development need certain things to get to a certain goal. And we might talk more about what they need in an objective sense than in what they need by their own definition. Whereas for adults, when we talk about well-being, we allow the adult to say, well, what's in my best interest is how I define my best interest. And we don't have a good way to try to figure out how you deal with that for someone whose interests are developing. Likewise, in terms of self-determination, how do you determine what, you know, what's uh, protecting or promoting their own self-identity when their self-identity is developing? 
So what are you supposed to listen to and what are you supposed to facilitate here? Are you supposed to just get them to a point where they have a fully developed self-identity? Um, or are you supposed to do something else? And you can think about it in these terms. One, one way to, um, or one proposal uh, ha that has been made is that, well, what you really need to do is think about how important is the decision to the individual's self-identity? How linked is it? And this might be a reason why you see courts more likely to defer to religious determinations when the child truly holds a strong religious belief because it's very linked to self-identity. And our goal here is to protect the interest in self-determination or promote this development of self-identity. The paradox, I think, is, is that as the decision becomes that much uh, more crucial or more important, say, you know, clearly a decision about whether or not to consent to life-sustaining treatment is very integral to your development of self-identity because if you decline and you die, you don't develop the self beyond that point. Um, so I think the strange paradox here is that with kids, you might have a situation where you're sort of saying, well, the more important the decision is, the more you should be listening to them. But the more the important the decision is, perhaps the more important the consequences and the less you want to listen to them. And the law doesn't give you a good way to weigh between the two of them. Um, there's also some other conceptual issues here, and they've been alluded to a little bit. There are concepts of parental rights. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about them in great detail, but I think it's at least worth, worth acknowledging that they're much richer than um, some of the brief comments that we've made here. And we don't have the time to get into them in detail, but you can have entire discussions about where concepts of parental rights come from, what they mean, what parental role should be. But there's also concepts of state interest. State interest in having children grow up to be adults state interest in healthy citizens, and these are other things that can play a role in decision making for adolescents. Now, one way to think about this whole thing with adolescent decision making from a legal standpoint is, you know, if we could, we'd set the age of consent at 35, because that's when you could become president, and honestly, you really shouldn't be making decisions before then. <laughs> However, the truth of the matter is we can't, because it seems odd that we can send you to war, but we can't, you know, you can't make decisions about this. And it seems odd that you can do all sorts of other stuff but not make decisions about this. So we acknowledge that we are limited after 18, not because we think that 18 was the point at which you had capacity, but because 18 was the point at which we as a society could no longer limit your decisions. And the law is as likely to take those kind of stands as anything else. Nothing in the law and decision making of 18 said, 18 was a magic number, now you had all the capacity. So where does this leave us in informed consent for minors? Uh, it leaves us a couple places. One is lots of questions, not a lot of answers. And I always hate to do this, um, although I derive, I must say, some glee in this, especially having situations where I've gone into healthcare providers and they've not given me answers. I can turn around and say to you, you know what? The law doesn't give you answers. Um, it gives you lots of questions. Uh, one uh, big area besides the ones we, we noted that it leaves you uh, with is this issue of assent. There's very little, if anything, in the treatment context that talks about what assent means. How do you give assent? Can you give a refusal under this model or not? There's a little bit in the research literature, but that is a very different situation. So how do you deal with assent? Uh, the next part of this is sort of uh, parental permission. We know there's a role for parental permission, but if parents have to give a full informed consent, they're entitled to all the information that the, the individual would have had. And as Abigail will point out, confidentiality concerns make that difficult. So can you have a situation where you're getting parental permission without full information? And what does that mean? Again, we're moving away from this traditional informed consent model, and it's not clear how you deal with that. And then we've already talked a bit about disagreement. How do you deal with disagreement? What do you do with disagreement? Um, again, the law can be very unclear about how you deal with these things. So I want to leave you with my sort of favorite quote. This is another notion of the rule of sevens. Uh, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Right? <laughs> We don't, you know, we have to be careful in thinking that this kind of idea that you go from 14 to 21 and suddenly you see the world the same way as everyone around you, realize your deficiencies. We all know we're different people now than we were earlier, but we very rarely look back on that time and say, we understand it was us that was deficient. I'm pretty sure that at 21, my daughter's still going to say to me, and when I was growing up, you still got it all wrong, right? <laughs>
But, you know, that's their perspective, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Under the HIPAA privacy rule, minors are treated as individuals in three different circumstances. If they have the right to consent and they have given consent for health care, uh, if they can obtain care without parental consent and either they themselves or a court or someone else has consented for them, and this, this exception was created, or this um, criterion was really created for the abortion context and judicial bypass proceedings. And the third, and this one is really extremely interesting and very important, is when parents have acceded to a confidentiality agreement between the minor and the healthcare provider. And those of you in the room who are pediatricians or adolescent medicine clinicians, I'm sure are familiar with the phenomenon that when Susie is 11 or 12 or 13 and the um, pediatrician or the healthcare professional says to Susie and her mom, you know, now that Susie is 12 or 13, uh, it's really important that she and I have an opportunity to talk privately. And I hope that's okay with you, Mrs. Jones. And Mrs. Jones says, yes, that's fine. That's a clinical practice that has been longstanding. The HIPAA privacy rule has actually accorded some legal significance to that practice and now considers in those circumstances that the minor is an individual for purposes of the HIPAA privacy rule. So what does that mean? Well, the minor, as an individual, can exercise rights with regard to protected health information that other individuals can exercise. And these are not unlimited rights, but they are important rights of access to information and some degree of control over disclosure and an ability to request some special privacy protections. But when we look at the really central issue for many adolescents who are concerned about privacy, and not all adolescents are at every moment in their, in their development, the issue is really can parents have access to the information? And on this issue, the HIPAA privacy rule compromised, or punted, if you will, and said, that issue will be determined by looking to state, and this is a quote, state or other applicable law. And if state or other applicable law requires disclosure to the parents, then that must occur. If it prohibits it or prohibits it without the permission of the minor, that must occur. If it permits it, the provider has discretion to decide whether or not to disclose, and if the law is silent or unclear, the provider also has discretion to grant or withhold access to the parents. Now this means that, that in, in some sense the HIPAA privacy rule imported into itself that entire list of state and federal laws that could have a bearing on whether or not minors are entitled to confidentiality protection with respect to the, the disclosure of information um, to their parents. And this has, in some sense, not changed the existing framework because those laws were already, were already there and were already applicable. But it has created um, a challenging situation for healthcare professionals who want to protect the confidentiality of adolescent health information but who really are uncertain about how this HIPAA privacy rule works in relation to other state and federal laws. Um, and I think that, you know, all of us have had the experience of going to the doctor's office and being given three or four sheets of fine print that we kind of look at and sign, and if we all read it carefully, the whole healthcare system would come to a grinding halt because it would take us each 45 minutes at least to read each page. But if you can imagine an adolescent going to the doctor's office and being given three sheets of fine print and trying to understand what that means, much less the healthcare professional trying to understand what the relationship is between these rules and the existing legal framework. So that really, I think, brings us back to the importance of some of the ethical principles in applying a complex legal framework at a practical level in a way that is um, manageable and meaningful 
for the relationship between the healthcare professional, the adolescent, and the family. And when the HIPAA privacy rule says that in certain circumstances, the provider has discretion whether or not to disclose information to parents, that discretion should be informed not just by their knowledge of this complex framework of state and federal laws, and not just by um, what they know about the minor consent laws, but also by what they know about um, biomedical ethics. So let me just say a few words about confidentiality protections that exist in the state minor consent laws um, because they do have relevance under HIPAA. Some of those minor consent laws contain explicit protections of confidentiality. Um, sometimes the minor consent laws are referred to in other medical records laws that say, you know, medical information in these records shall be protected as confidential, um, including under circumstances where the minor has uh, consented to care, uh, and, and in those circumstances the minor's permission must be sought. Um, and some of the minor consent laws, not an insignificant number of them, themselves grant discretion to physicians to um, make a determination about whether or not to disclose information. And I'll just um, summarize by saying that I think all adolescents should have access to comprehensive health care, and that confidentiality um, is an important element of that, that uh, protecting consent and confidentiality for adolescents is not inconsistent with helping them communicate effectively with their parents and other adults, although it is sometimes portrayed that way. Uh, in the public arena. And current laws do provide strong protection, but they are also at risk. One of my adolescent med medicine colleagues summed it up by saying, when a teenager needs help, confidential health care is better than no health care at all. And um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that the research findings and the current professional leg and legal guidelines support parental involvement, but they also support the availability of confidential adolescent health care for some adolescents and for specific sensitive health problems. Thank you. You've been watching speakers from the 2009 Pediatrics Bioethics Conference, No Longer a Child, Not Yet an Adult, Ethical Issues in Adolescent Health Care, presented by the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital. about this series of programs, please go to www.seattlechildrens.org.